everyone, I'm Sam and welcome to The Shiggly Stitch. Today we're going to be talking all about five lessons from my first year of spinning. Hi everyone, so as I said, I'm Sam and this is The Shiggly Stitch, my channel where I talk about all things related to knitting, spinning, and any other fiber arts. Today I'm going to be looking back through a full year of spinning. So today is April 9th that I'm filming and I just looked back at when I got my first spinning wheel, or my only spinning wheel, and it turns out it was actually April 10th of 2022. So it has literally been one full year that I have now been spinning. And so I thought it would be interesting to take a look back at everything I've worked on over the year, uh, where I've improved, and just a few lessons that I've taken away that I hope can be helpful for you too. Um, a bit of admin, you can find me obviously here as well as on Instagram at the Shigley Stitch. Anything that I talk about that has links will be linked in the description box below. So if there's anything that you want to find more details about, they will be linked there. One last thing to mention is that I do still have a giveaway running. If you go over to my most recent episode all about the Scottish Wool Producers Showcase, you can enter to win a skin of yarn and a project bag um, and go look for the details there on how you can enter to win those things. And I think that is it, so I'll just get started. A quick look at um, what I'm wearing, just in case you're curious. This is the Wardy cardigan and it's a pattern by Isolde. Um, this isn't hand spun, this is in Rama Fenul. And then I'm also probably going to be working on some knitting while I film, just because it goes better if I keep my hands busy while I'm trying to speak. So uh, these are um, vanilla socks that if you've been watching my channel you'll have seen a few other times. I'm getting pretty far on them, hopefully get along to the cuff shortly, but yeah, that is what I'm working on while I'm speaking to you. So the way I'm going to structure this is uh, chronologically. I am going to look at everything I have spun over the last year and intersperse the lessons that I have taken away while kind of reflecting on how that year has gone um, within, within those things that I've spun. So let me first start out by explaining actually how I got started spinning. So spinning was something that had kind of been in the back of my mind as something I wanted to try out, but it was kind of maybe a down the line type of thing. I didn't really know where to get started. I knew that wheels could be expensive and so it wasn't necessarily at the forefront of my mind as something that I was definitely going to try in the near future. However, last year um, around Mother's Day in the UK, which is end of March, I was at a Mother's Day kind of gathering um, with my partner's mom and his sister and her partner and her partner's mom as well. So kind of my almost brother-in-law's mom had, basically we got chatting because she's a very crafty person and she was talking about all the different things that she's done. And I was saying, oh, I might be kind of interested in getting into weaving as I had seen a place near me that does like day long courses where you can just try out a little bit of weaving on a rigid heddle loom. And so we were kind of chatting about that and then she asked if I had ever considered spinning and she basically said that she had a wheel, an Ashford traditional, that she wasn't using, hadn't ever completely got the hang of I think, and due to some mobility limitations wasn't really able to use at this point in time so she offered the loan of it to me and I of course was thrilled to take her up on that offer because it was basically a free way to try out some spinning and dip my toes in and see if I actually even liked it. So after that chat, I was able to get the spinning wheel from her and it turned out she also had a few extra accessories. So she had some hand cards, which are just here. Um, I haven't used them tons. And she also had a small drum carter, which um, ultimately came really useful. So with all those things, it was um, more than enough to try out spinning and see, see how, I, how I got along basically. And so I got the wheel on April 10th, 2022, and obviously um, got right into it. I started out by watching a lot of videos on YouTube, as I'm sure kind of many of you 
do if you're watching this channel. You know, it can be a really helpful way to learn new techniques. And I think especially with spinning, given that there's so many things that are kind of in movement at once, it's easier to watch someone do it than to try and understand just by reading a book. So I tried to find a few different resources to learn from. The main one that came in useful for me was Jillian Eve. She has some really brilliant beginner spinner videos. And the extra, extra helpful thing was that she actually has an Ashford traditional as well. So there, I won't go too into depth, but there are, I think, two main types of spinning wheels. One is called Saxony and one is called Castle. And the Saxony style wheels are the ones where it's kind of your traditional, like what you might envision if you think of a spinning wheel. So there's um, the wheel and the, the flyer and they are kind of next to each other. And then if you get a castle style wheel, it's all kind of more in line. I'll stick some pictures up so it makes more sense. So a castle style wheel it tends to be a lot more portable, a lot more compact, and the Saxony one is a bit, I don't know, if, if some people like the aesthetic more. For me it was just I was offered this particular style of wheel so that was the one I went with. So I, it wasn't a lot of me kind of dithering about what kind of wheel I wanted to try out. This was the one that was offered, this was the one I tried. <laughs> Um, but yes, Jillian Eve has the exact same wheel as me, and hers is actually a vintage Ashford traditional as well. So I think mine is from the 70s or 80s. So she was super helpful because she has videos that are intended for like complete beginners. So she's talking about how to learn to control your traveling and manage your fiber as it's as you're drafting it um she had a really good recommendation which um is kind of learning about how to um control like treadling and the fiber uptake and that is to kind of practice with just actual spun yarn first so you can get the feel of the treadling and how that goes on to the flyer without actually having to worry about drafting the yarn because that can be the tricky part to begin with so that was definitely a good recommendation, just practicing treadling and getting that feeling automatic before actually starting to play with fiber. So that is definitely where I started out. And my first skein, as, as most people's, was of questionable quality. And that kind of leads into my first lesson. So my first lesson from this last year of spinning is to not be afraid to make mistakes. And this can be a hard one for people, especially if you've been doing uh, an adjacent fiber craft for quite a long time. I've been knitting since I was like 10 or something, so I'd like to think I'm pretty good at knitting at this point and I'm a confident knitter. And spinning, as I say, very much fiber adjacent, or it is a fiber craft and knitting adjacent, but it is not the same skill at all. So you really need to go into it and not being afraid to make mistakes, um, let yourself mess up. It, it kind of looks really easy. If you're just watching someone who's skilled at it do it it's one of those things um I, I feel like ice skating is another one of those things like it looks super easy you just get on the ice and you slide around but actually when you try it out for the first time you go all over the place and the same thing can happen with fiber so let me show you my first skein so the wheel as i said the wheel that i was borrowing it hadn't particularly been used any re anytime recently and um so it needed a bit of maintenance which is part of why i'm telling myself that this looks like it looks but you can see it's quite thick and thin, like very dramatically so. Like there's some bits that look kind of like normal yarn, and then there's some bits that are basically not spun at all. <laughs> and I think a lot of people's first skeins look a little bit like this. Now, this wasn't helped by the fact that my the drive band on my wheel kept slipping, or like it wasn't actually turning my wheel, and I think it just needed a new drive band. I eventually, um, after, I was so excited to try it out, I basically just tried it, tried spinning this without doing really any maintenance on the wheel, which is obviously not recommended. <laughs> so after I spun this um, first skein, I then bought a, a maintenance kit from Ashford, um, which had a new drive band in it and a new tension band, a brake band, that's what it's called. Um, and some oil and I just kind of refreshed the setup of the wheel. Um, so that led into um, me being more prepared to do my next skein. So this was the first skein and it was just, I think it was maybe 25 grams of yarn. My next skein 
turned out a lot better as you can see. So this looks a lot more like yarn. Now it is very, very fuzzy. And that's because this is actually just kind of a coarser wool than the first one around. I will undo it even so you can see as well. So this, I mean, I absolutely would not use this for a garment. It is incredibly almost hairy. Um, and I, I would say rope-like, but again, I do think that's down to a lot to the fiber. Um, you can see like the actual hairiness of it. Um, but you can see that that looks a lot more like yarn, so my maintenance was successful. So I had done that first brown skein like the day I got the wheel. So that was April 10th, 2022, and then I did this one on April 15th. Um, and it went a lot better, clearly. From there, it only improved. And this, I think, was maybe the third skein that I did. And again, I think this is pretty good for like... At the time I was a complete beginner like that's pretty even there's some thick and thin bits in there for sure but I'm quite happy I, I you know I was happy with that for sure at the time and that was a, from a sample pack so yeah not being afraid to make mistakes and just kind of giving yourself grace when you are first starting out, like you're not going to be perfect and you need to be okay with not being perfect when you're first learning any new skill. And just reminding yourself of that when you're first starting out uh, can kind of help you maintain the desire to keep learning if you're not putting so much pressure on yourself to be perfect all the time. My second recommendation or lesson that I take from this kind of ties into the first one and that is just to start small. So those first few skeins that I showed you, those were all made from uh, a couple different sample packs that I bought. So when I was first starting out, I decided to buy some sample packs from World of Wool. And the packs that I bought, I got a Breed Discovery pack, which there's still two, <laughs> two left in there that I haven't used yet. But that had eight, I can't remember how many grams each, maybe 10 grams each of fiber. And that's just a way to play around with different with different breeds and kind of learn a bit more about like the different finenesses of the fiber and what you prefer to spin and how much easier or harder some um, particular breeds can be. So that really hairy white one I believe was, it might have been Devon or Swaledale, I don't really know for sure, but it was certainly one of the higher micron ones, uh, anywhere from 30 to 35 I believe. So that's part of the reason why it's so coarse and a bit hairier looking. Whereas that um, pale brown, I think, was a lovely Shetland, um, which is much finer. So it's interesting to learn. This was one way, quick way to start learning about the differences in the breeds that you can buy. The other pack that I bought was a collection. They, they make a variety of themed color collections. So this was the graphite gray. And it came with six different types of uh, fibers. They're blends of fibers. There was a merino, alpaca, wool, viscose, merino, nylon, merino, merino and silk, and alpaca and silk, and 25 grams each. So that was enough to um, give me a chance to play around with some different fibers and try again to learn a bit more about the different types of fiber and what it's like to spin those and what can be trickier or what, what can be easier, etc. So these were one way that I started small, just literally with small amounts of fiber. The other way that I started small is that at the beginning I started, so I started spinning kind of quite near the time of the Tour de Fleece, which is takes place at the same time as the Tour de France, and it's basically a way that you can make goals for yourself um, related to spinning. So some people want to spin um, a particular amount of fiber. Some people just want to spin every single day. It's just kind of an excuse to make a spinning related goal for yourself. And I think you can take place in or take part in different kind of group activities and there's chances to win prizes. I know there's a whole thing on Ravelry about it and then different dyers or uh, companies will also do particular uh, special deals or st things like that. So basically the other way that I started small was just by spinning 15 minutes a day. And you'll actually be shocked at how quickly 15 minutes a day can help you improve. So I think even those first three skeins, like you can see a very quick improvement. I'll put them in this order. 
you can see a very quick improvement there. And if I'm being honest, I can't remember if this was the third thing I spun I, or if it was these two items. I've also got these two that I just never plied up. I just spun the singles and have not plied. Um, but they were, again, part of that sample pack. And I think I think these probably were between before the kind of rainbowy gray one because they're a lot more thick and thin. And yeah, I just never got around to applying them because I didn't really, want, I wasn't excited about like the natural colors. <laughs> um, so they're still sitting like that. I might do something with all this early days stuff at some point, or it might just be there as proof of what I was doing in the beginning. <laughs> so yeah, starting small, um, both in the quantity of fiber that you're spinning and also just um, in the amount of time that you're spending each day is my next lesson. And 15 minutes a day sounds like nothing, but actually it adds up and I think it improved my skill quite quickly. I think making the effort to work 15 minutes a day just kind of gave me that little bit of dopamine and finishing something like, oh, I could tick off that I've done my 15 minutes every single day, even though I was excited about it. Um, if there was a point in time where I was maybe struggling a little bit more or I wasn't as excited about a particular sa breed sample that I was trying out, just having done the 15 minutes made me feel like, oh, yep, I've done it for the day, check that off, move on to the next thing. Or uh, equally, if I got to the end of my 15 minutes and I wanted to keep going, that was also fine. But yeah, just giving yourself, again, giving yourself grace, it kind of ties into th that first lesson of not being afraid to make mistakes. Um, but just starting out small and starting out with small quantities can set you up for success. My third lesson kind of ties into those world of wool sample packs as well and that is to just use the good stuff so i think a trap that people can fall into when they're just learning a new skill is they don't want to buy the nice stuff because they're afraid that they'll ruin it and i i don't think i subscribe to that i understand wanting to buy small quantities or not wanting to get too far into a massive project that you're not sure that you'll like but i do think that you should buy something to work with that you are excited to work with. So my particular example for this is that is that gray sample pack from the World of Wool. It had lots of really interesting color blends that I was excited to try out and excited to use and also some really soft fiber blends and just different different things that I was interested to try each new thing. So I decided just to buy it to be fair, they weren't large amounts, but I was still using kind of good stuff that would um, still provide a learning opportunity. So yeah, let me show you a few of the things that came out of that. I don't have tons of it here. I don't think all of it is spun up again, but this is one of them. So I was excited to use this because it's such a fun color. Like it's gray with rainbowy uh, kind of sparkly fibers. And then the other one that I have to show here is this was, I believe, an alpaca silk blend. I can't exactly remember for sure, but it was very, very soft. And I worked on that like towards as, as I had been improving. So I think by the time I got around to this one, it was mid-June. So I've been um, playing around with spinning for a good two months at this point. And oftentimes it was only 15 minutes a day. But yeah, that's that's how I... At that point, I was doing fairly fine yarn, but still it was only at this point working with those really, those small sample packs. So I still hadn't bought like a full braid of yarn to play with. So this one, you can see, um, is very fine. And this is, yeah, this is a three ply. So this gave me the confidence to move on to a big skein. So while I do say it used the good stuff, I guess I kind of didn't 100% follow that, but I think in hindsight I could have. I don't know, it's a balancing act because I, I would consider this like good because it's interesting fiber and it's not just like the cheapest possible fiber in like the most plain colors. But at the same time, it was small enough that if it didn't go well, I didn't feel like I was risking that much. Like I didn't feel like I was going to ruin anything. So I'm not sure that I'm completely taking my own advice <laughs> as far as like buying, just buying whatever you want to work with. But yeah, I still think that is a good recommendation. Um, I'll add in something, a few other things here that I was kind of playing around with at the same time. 
So as I mentioned, I also got a drum carter um, with the spinning wheel and that is how I got these three skeins made. So these two um, I made with some of the plain white merino that came in the breed study pack from World of Wool. And what I did with these was take, um, take scraps and card them together with the white merino wool. And I think it worked most effectively on this blue one, but it also was the most time consuming. And I think, yeah, on this one, I was separating out my scraps, my yarn scraps. It, like I was pulling apart the commercial yarn into its individual plies. And then I carded it together with the white merino wool. And so that made it much easier for it to actually integrate into the fiber and turned out pretty well. I have no idea if I'm going to do anything with this again. I might just combine all of these into like, I don't know, some weird mishmash or I might just keep them as my experimental beginners projects. <laughs> um, and I did a similar thing with this green one, except that I spun the merino fiber up with the green scraps and then I actually applied it with a commercial yarn. I didn't really know if it would work. It was a lace weight. The commercial yarn is a lace weight made up of like multiple really, really fine plies. So I wasn't sure 100% if it would work or like be over, -ener over energized, but it seems okay. Um, again, I'm not really sure that I would use it, like what I would use it for, if I'm being perfectly honest. Let's see if it's actually balanced. I mean, yeah, pretty balanced. It's not really twisting much. So I think that the, I didn't apply it overly tight and there are a few curly cues. But again, this was just kind of an experimental project to see what would happen. <laughs> um, I think that again ties into my first lesson about not being afraid to make mistakes. Like I was just playing around with this and to see what would happen, not with any kind of end goal in mind, just to see, yeah, how it would go. There's a lot of value in learning by doing and experimenting, I think. And then this was another one. I had a, a gray Shetland wool. I don't necessarily love how this turned out, if I'm being perfectly honest. I don't think the, um, I don't think that the scraps integrated as well into this one. So I might, I don't know. But I mean, that's still a lesson. Um, it definitely worked better when you when I separated all of the scrap yarns out into its individual plies, but that's also very tedious and time consuming and I'm not convinced that I really want to spend the time to do that. But it's still interesting. So yeah, all of those were kind of lessons and a way to play around with using the drum carter as well. So once I had finished that quite fine kind of alpaca silk beigey colored yarn, at that point I was confident enough that I wanted to buy a full braid of fiber. And I decided to buy a braid of fiber for sock yarn, <laughs> which I realize in hindsight is maybe not like the best beginner project, but at that point I had tried a lot of different types of fiber and I was confident that I could spin quite finely. So I was thinking, what can you make with like one 100 gram skein? And I knit a lot of socks, as I mentioned before, so I thought sock yarn would be the perfect thing to give a try. So that is what I did next. I'll pop some pictures up of the first, uh, of the skein, of the fiber as it started. And then here is the, the balls that I have left. So it was a double-ended gradient from Hilltop Fiber in a, a sock blend. And... That is how the, th that's how the remaining skeins look. And I have already actually knit up the socks as well. So this is a three ply fractal. Um, so I took the fiber and I split it and I spun, I split it into three and I spun the first one just end to end. And then I think I split the next one into maybe, I don't know, two strips. And the one after that into four strips. I can't remember for sure, but it was definitely a fractal style. And then these are the socks that I have made and have actually worn quite a lot since then. So there we are. There's one and the other. And I think I've mentioned before 
that I quite like to I quite like to stripe like a crazy zauber ball. I'll split it into two and then stripe either end on itself and make very similarly striped socks to this. And so that's the approach I took with this because I didn't just want a long slow gradient going out the foot. I wanted something a bit different with some stripes. So yeah, that is what these are. I would say there's a bit of wear on these. I don't know if it's maybe, I think there's bio nylon in them. It's a Cheviot silk and bio nylon, which I think just means that, that it can biodegrade over time. So there's kind of a bit of wear and fuzz coming out of them. You can kind of see if you look really closely, but overall I'm really happy with how they're wearing so far. And the thing I've actually noticed that I really like and is making me want to get more non-superwash sock yarn is that they spring back into place so well. Like a lot of my superwash sock yarns, which is what you see in tons of places, it, the socks fit and then they stretch out like as soon as you as, as soon as you've worn them once and it's quite annoying I don't like having baggy socks so these haven't stretched out and I've worn them a lot of times I think maybe my superwash ones would spring back if I put them in the dryer but I just feel like that'll make them wear out quicker so I'm not likely to be putting my socks in the dryer so I just need to maybe knit smaller socks and be prepared for them to stretch a little bit but yeah that was the next spin that I did so I had started spinning in April and then I um, was about a third of the way through that gradient braid by July 7th and looking at my Instagram I finished the spin on July 16th and then my actual socks were finished um, October 3rd. So pretty good progress April, so May, June, July, three months in I was doing a sock spin which I'm in hindsight like fairly impressed by to be perfectly honest. Um, I think that's the other thing about being a beginner. You kind of don't know what you don't know, so you just go for it. Like no one's told you that you can't, so you just go for it and it works out, then great. <laughs> and if it doesn't, well, that's another lesson you've learned. Um, the next spin I did after that was actually another pair of socks or a another sock spin. And so that, that one that I had just showed was a three ply and then the other one is a two ply. So I wanted to experiment a little bit more with the construction of the yarn that I was spinning. And so this is the next skein that I finished. You can see a lot of barber pulling in this one. And for this one, I didn't do any particular kind of color management. I just split it into two and spun it. It wasn't a gradient braid. It was just kind of variegated. And I'm working on making another pair of socks. To be fair, I haven't worked on these in absolutely ages because I decided I wanted to put cables on them to make them a little bit more interesting. But then I tend to work on socks as my like brainless project that doesn't need attention. So then these aren't getting worked on because they do need attention. <laughs> but if I have time to spend on something that needs attention, I don't always wanna work on socks. Anyways, so I'm working on these for Cameron, my partner. And I don't know that I even should have bothered with cables. I probably should have done something more like maybe a broken rib or some kind of rib texture because you can't really see the cables very well. But I've done it now, so I'm just gonna leave it. Um, you can kind of see them if I stretch it out a bit more. So yeah, I'm not convinced that this is my favorite color, or maybe I like should have managed the colors differently. I don't know. They're not bad. It's quite earthy blues and browns. There's a bit of green in there somewhere as well. So it's nice from that perspective, but the, the actual, the hand spun nature of it does make the cables quite hard to see, which is fine, is what it is at this point. So that was the next project I did, and that was, I think I finished that at the beginning of August. So I spun a couple braid, sock braids, like, pretty quickly. After that, I think I took a little bit of a break from spinning. Not a proper break, um, I think it was mostly because I was on holiday, we went home and visited my family. So when I got back, I got more into spinning again. At that point, I visited the Perth Yarn Festival, which is now called the Scottish, Perth Festival of Yarn, Scottish Yarn Festival. Yeah, it's called that now, I think. It's now called the Scottish Yarn Festival. And at that event, I was able to buy an art fat from Celia McWheely. Now I will put a picture of the fiber as it was when I bought it up. It was really big. I think it was 250 grams. So 
when I got it, it was about 250 grams of hand dyed Rambouillet, non mules merino, and mulberry silk. So that's obviously massive. And it's in these lovely bluey colors, and I've, it's called, it was called Seascape. And I've shown this multiple times on the channel before because I've already made some projects with it. But I'll show it again. So this was my next project. And it's mostly blues and teals, but it has these pops of magenta. And there's kind of some paler pinky-ish colors, kind of like mauve and some darker tealy silk and some white silk in there as well. So that was my next spin and that took a good chunk of time. And on this one, I was just spinning two ply and I just spun it kind of how it wanted to be spun. I'd never really spun from a bat before and yeah, didn't really do any color management. I would just like rip a bit off the side of the bat and spin it. And it's even enough, a bit thick and thin in places, but as I say, I was just kind of letting this one do what it wanted. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to see how the colors came out. So that was my next one. And I was working on that kind of through October and November. Um, I also did another sock spin at this time. And that was with a braid of fiber from, I think, Cat and Sparrow. And I don't actually have that to show, but I'll put a picture up. And that's because I gave that one away to a friend for Christmas. Um, obviously, a knitting friend. Um, and I think at that point, I was kind of done with the sock spins for a little while. Like, it's rewarding, but I had enough. I have enough sock yarn, sock yarn as it is as well. And I didn't, it, it, it's like a slow spin because you need it to be fine yarn. Um, right, so the next thing I'll mention as far as lessons go is that I suggest finding an in-person group to meet with if at all possible. And it was about this point in my spinning journey, for lack of a better word, that I joined the Edinburgh Guild of Weavers, Spinners, and Dyers. So I realize that it's not possible for everyone to find a group to meet with in person just due to like geography or, you know, you might be in a really remote area. Um, there might not be any groups like that around you, but where possible, I definitely recommend it. I have found it so valuable. I think even finding an online community can be equally as useful. You know, there, there are online guilds now or you can find different kind of spinning groups or like Zoom meetups or there's um, a Discord server as well that Tashi from Stitches and Starlight as well as a few other people but I think she mentioned it on her podcast are, are active on and that's a really great community for just sharing different things that you're into as far as knitting and spinning. I think it's um, primarily a stash down server but there's just a lot of general chat about spinning and knitting and different fiber arts. I think there's crochet and sewing on there as well so finding a virtual community can be equally as useful. But I have to say I have really enjoyed my guild meetings. They You can just learn so many different things from people when you go to something in person and just see how other people are spinning. Um, again, it's a weaver, spinners, and dyers uh, guild that I've joined, so it's not just spinning that I can learn about. There, We had a, a loom tasting day, I believe they were calling it, where a lot of people brought in different um, weaving looms that they had and we're allowing other people to try them out. So that was a really great experience. So I definitely recommend finding an in-person group just because, again, you don't know what you don't know. So if you don't know of a particular technique or like something that you don't even have the language to kind of try and go research it. And whereas if you go to one of these in-person events, you might just see someone doing something completely different or in a, in a way that you um, hadn't thought of before. Or like an example is that I saw someone doing inkle weaving or tab kind of inkle loom weaving, which is, I think, makes these really skinny bits of fabric that you could kind of use as straps or belts. And I've seen people using blending boards and processing raw fiber. And that's something I've kind of seen online in different videos before, but never in person. So it's really interesting to be able to see in person, ask someone why they're doing whatever they're doing in that particular way or why they chose that method. And yeah, it's just a really great way to <laughs> learn new things and um, be able to be in a community of people that all enjoy the same thing that you enjoy and have that kind of same base level of knowledge. So it's, it's great to be able to chat with them and you're all kind of starting from the same page and you all know about the kind of the same skill. So yeah, I would definitely recommend meeting with 
um, an in-person group if at all possible. And as I say, even if you have, if you find a virtual group, but it's still a group of people doing the same thing that you love, um, it can be equally as valuable. There's a lot to be learned just from being in a community. I think another group that would be useful that I'll mention here, actually, I haven't joined it, but I watch her podcasts every time they come out, is Rachel from Wool and Spinning. She is uh, brilliant. <laughs> Her episodes are really interesting. I learn something new every time. I know she has a very active community that you can join via Patreon and I believe she there's like a Slack that you can join and participate in. I haven't done that yet just because I feel like I'm busy enough as it is and if I try and keep up with another thing going on uh, it'll just be too much but I think I probably will at some point because it's very interesting just the different things that they talk about and that she talks about even just on the podcast and I'm sure if I were to join the actual um, Patreon uh, it would be even more uh, useful. So I think that would actually be my recommendation as far as joining a virtual community if you can't find something in person. So after I joined the guild I then started on some bigger projects. So I'd done my two sock yarn spins and at that point I decided I wanted to, to spin for a sweater. So this was the first kind of bigger spin that I did and this is two skeins of a three ply fractal spun yarn about DK weight-ish. Um, again this is from a gradient from Hilltop Fiber. I joined her Never Ending Gradient Club. Um, so there's different fibers that come every month or a different color that comes every month it's 100 grams of blue face luster and each month starts the gradient starts from the end of last month's gradient so this was two and a bit months worth that happened to be in colors that I really enjoyed and my intention for this is to make the pressed flowers cardigan but I haven't actually spun the main color yet so these are just here waiting for when I spin the main color but I'm really happy with how they turned out um, they're lovely and squishy and it's great colors. So that was my next project. After that I then moved on to my first full sweater spin. Yeah. So I don't actually have the yarn to share because I've already made the sweater. My sister was getting me a Christmas present at, and asked what I wanted and I said just give me a gift card for John Arbin Textiles and they sell both fiber and yarn. And so I got the main color for my metamorphic sweater. And this uh, was the Yarnadelic top in indigo dust. And my intention was to use this as the contrast color and then that teal Yarnadelic as the main color. And that's exactly what I did. So I got that yarn like right before Christmas. I think she gave me the gift card like right before Christmas and it arrived in time for me to spin it up on my holiday break. So that was probably the fastest spin I've ever done. And I spun a two ply, I would say it's probably DK to light worsted. I wanted it to be more of a DK, but it was 100% Corydale and it turns out that fiber plumps up a lot. So um, it's probably kind of in between the two. And I made the metamorphic sweater. So I'll hold that up here. And I'll put up a picture of me wearing it. I've worn it on the channel before. I'm really happy with how it turned out. It was definitely the fastest spin I've ever done and it was actually a really quick knit as well. I could have finished it even faster but I was working on a sample knit and um, a couple a test knit as well so it wasn't the fastest. But yeah so you can see that I used that uh, Celia McWheelie fiber in there and then that was this dark teal was the yarn delic top. And it's so lovely, so soft. One of my coziest sweaters. So I'm really happy with that. So I finished that, my first hand sewn sw sweater, before a year was up of spinning. <laughs> but again, it's it's one of these things, like, just try it. Like, don't be afraid to make mistakes and just give it a go. And what's the worst thing that'll happen? You make some yarn that isn't, like, your favorite. But actually, it turns out that knitting your hand spun can hide a lot of inconsistencies. <laughs> Like I would say that my my yarn and Alex spin wasn't the most consistent thing. This certainly isn't the most consistent because I wasn't really spinning for consistency, for being honest. But knitting it up, you wouldn't have any idea. Like you can't tell with the finished textile that there's any inconsistencies there. There might be a few like 
bits that stand out that are particularly fluffy, but you have to really be looking for it. So that is another positive thing, that knitting just hides a lot of, quote unquote, <laughs> knitting does just hide a lot of inconsistencies. So my final lesson is that I would also recommend that you try different tools and techniques and don't just get stuck on one thing. So I mentioned before I um, had done a multiple skeins of sock yarn, so I tried to switch it up to something different. I had played around a little bit with my drum carter, but I decided that I really wanted to get stuck into using my drum carter. And actually when I was back in the US in August visiting my family, um, turns out my mom knew someone who had some alpacas and I got some alpaca fiber. I didn't know how to process alpaca, I just decided I'd bring it back and see what happened. <laughs> And you know what? It worked out. I, I, just, I started googling, how do you process alpaca fiber? And alpaca is actually not the worst thing to start out with because it isn't as greasy as wool. So you don't need to worry about having really hot water and having all the proper soaps and like making sure that the lanolin doesn't harden again. That can be an issue with uh, when you're processing raw wool. If you get the if the water cools down too much, the lanolin can um, then cool back down and get attached to the fleece in a not very nice way. Whereas the main issue with alpaca is that they just love to roll in dirt. Uh, so it's very dusty. So um, at this point, I tried um, kind of around the end of the year and last autumn as well, I started playing around with some of the alpaca fiber and using my drum carter. It's a very small drum carter. It, it does the job, it's much easier than hand cards, but <laughs> don't start thinking I've got like this massive drum carter. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I just decided to start trying to process alpaca fiber and see what happened with that. And what happened with that is that it worked out. I washed it. It was, I definitely like almost felted some of it, but only a little bit. You have to be really, really careful not to agitate it at all. It will still felt even though it's not quite like wool. And this is... How it looks after it passed through the drum carter. It's this lovely dark brown color and alpaca doesn't have the same kind of memory as wool like it, it won't bounce back necessarily and hold its shape quite as well so I had all this alpaca and I decided I wanted to blend it with some wool and make um, a yarn that was more of a blend so that if I wanted to use it for a garment it would be reasonable to use it for a garment. At the time I didn't necessarily want to go out and buy a whole bunch of fiber when I had fiber that could be used up and that would I, I thought would probably blend in with the brown quite nicely. So what I ended up doing, I had little bits, I had some bits of kind of reddish and green left of wool from various experiments. Um, part of it was for actually from the NeverEnding Gradient Club. And then I had some random Shetland wool, grey wool that I bought. So I carded a lot of it together and made this kind of not very nice red, green, grey, brown. I had a little bit of dark purple and a bit of grey. And so I made up several quantities that were ready to be blended. So all this, wool, this is all wool, it's a mixture of Shetland, BFL, and then to mix with this amount of alpaca. So it's about a 60-40 blend. Um, so I would mix those together and that turns out to be like, so I'd mix all of the wool together and that would end up looking like this. And then I would mix that wool with the alpaca that looks like this. And so this is like two sheets that have come off the carter that are ready to be blended. It's definitely something I've been doing over a long period of time because my carter is not very big. And I comfortably only really want to put about 30 grams on it, which is not a ton. And then I just get bored with carding. So I have it all portioned out, the amounts per for each blend to be blended. And so, yeah, that's what that's what's happening. So those will be blended together. And in the end, they look like this. So you wouldn't even know that all those colors are in there, which I think is so interesting. And I currently have three skeins of my alpaca wool blend that are roughly, I want to say heavy fingering to light sport weight maybe. So yeah, these have been an experimentation in a couple of different ways. So firstly, obviously I was experimenting by just blending these different fibers and seeing what happened on the drum carter. I was pretty confident that the dark 
kind of blackish brown fiber would hide any kind of color like the colors would mix together enough that you wouldn't really be able to see them and it would just make this nice kind of heathery brown and that has turned out really well so again experimentation ideal <laughs> but the other thing that I did with these is I tried a new um, drafting technique so everything I've shown you so far has been spun short forward um it's the first way it's the way I learned it's the way I think a lot of people recommend you start out learning to spin and that is just a drafting style you can go look it up but it's basically you're just kind of going like that it's maybe what you would think is if you can envision someone spinning it's probably what you imagine and what I started doing with this is trying to learn long draw which is a form of woolen spinning um, and that's so if you compare a woolen spun yarn versus a worsted spun yarn woolen is usually spun from a carded prep which this was a carded preparation so the fibers are all misaligned and in disarray and then you spin it with in a, in a method that keeps more air in the fibers and keeps more air in the finished yarn and that should result in a kind of loftier yarn and you'll see um, different commercial yarns described as woolen or worsted spun as well and it's the same thing just on a more on a larger kind of commercial scale so everything i've been doing before was worsted spun and you're um, as you're spinning you're kind of compressing all the air out the fiber so you're drafting forward and then smoothing back forward and smooth etc etc um, and then in woolen spinning you don't do the spin you don't do the smoothing so you're not squishing all the air out of the fiber as you spin and I'll put a quick video up here of me doing a bit of woolen spinning. I've definitely been improving and it's something I, it's a method that I'm using on um, a, another current spin that I'm working on right now. Now the other thing is um, as well with trying different tools and techniques. So that's obviously a different technique that I was trying with the woolen spinning. I also have recently learned how to spin with a drop spindle. Now, most people probably start out learning to spin with a drop spindle. I did not because I obviously got the loan of the wheel, and which was free, and I would have had to buy a drop spindle. So it's like, might as well just give this a go. But it's not the most portable wheel for going to guild meetings. And in my January guild meeting, we were having a spin in. So everyone was just bringing their wheels to spin or spindles to spin with. I didn't have a drop spindle at that time. So I asked if anyone had one I could borrow. And then it turns out there was a lady who had one that I was able to purchase for a fairly reasonable price. And we were also doing a fiber swap. So I opened a parcel um, with this green fiber and learned how to do spin on the drop spindle. And it's a very similar skill set, but not exactly identical because you kind of have to manage more with just your hands. Whereas when you're spinning on the wheel, you're using your foot to treadle and then you're managing the fiber with your hands, whereas with a drop spindle, you have to keep the spindle spinning with your hands and then also be drafting and you have to wind it on. So there's just a few more things to think about and keep your hands managing. But I'm really glad that I did learn because it's a much more portable thing to take with me. So when I do go, go to guild meetings or I don't know, I'm not sure if I'll take spinning on a holiday. Maybe if we're doing kind of camping holidays, I might take it with me because it's something just a bit different than knitting but um, it just gives me more options and also um, there's a wide range of really lovely drop spindles and supportive spindles as far as buying from crafts craftsmen uh, crafts people who make just really gorgeous pieces of art that are also functional so it gives me a whole other route to go down in that respect as well so just to finish up the last few things that I've been working on in recent times that was my first drop spindle project this is, this is the same drop spindle. Uh, this isn't just a green project. It's a, uh, another double-ended sock gradient from Hilltop Cloud Fiber. Um, I've just got this much left. And this is the first half already on a bobbin ready for plying. I know you can ply on a drop spindle, but I don't want to do that because it's going to take forever. <laughs> so um, I've spun half of it on here and then put it off onto a bobbin and then I'm spinning the other half and uh, we'll put that back onto a bobbin as well and I'm planning to chain ply this so three ply and it'll just be a lovely rainbow gradient so it goes from this purple all the way to red and then back to purple so that is the current project and I've been working on that every day uh, with the goal of doing 15 minutes of uh, drop spindle spinning a day uh, for 100 days 
Um, another project that I finished fairly recently was this Rambouillet spin. It's my first time doing Rambouillet. I'm not convinced that I love it. I found it really easy to overspin, but I maybe just need to be more aware of that on the next braid. And my plan for this is to, uh, I'm making this for the lady that I got my wheel from. So I did ultimately buy it. I don't think I said that, but I did ultimately buy it from her. But I just wanted to make her some yarn because I know she knits it and a lot as a thank you for, for introducing me to spinning and giving me the chance to get into this new fiber craft that I'm really loving. So that is my most recent big spin or it's not a big spin, it's 100 grams. I need to spin a purple accent that I also have to go with it. I have also been working on another fiber blending project, which I'm closer to finishing. Um, and this is again using my drum carter. So I bought this BFL fiber from the Scottish Yarn Producer Showcase that I was at a few weeks back. And it's a fairly nice creamy white. It's um not the most well prepared, I would say. There's a lot of neps in it, which are those kind of clumpy bits. But I'm just embracing it and, you know, going with it for right now. But I really wanted an accent color for what I have left of that Celia McWheelie spin, the kind of teal that I used for my accent color for the metamorphic sweater. I didn't want a white contrast color. I wanted a kind of a pale gray. And I actually had a lot of grays left in my stash as well as a bit of black. So what I did is I picked out a few different yarns or a few different fibers. I'll put a picture up of the fibers and I blended all of them into this kind of mid gray. And then I've been blending these two together. So we've got a white and a gray and on first pass in the drum carter, they look like this. So they're not the most well blended you can still see some really streaky bits. So that's one pass in the drum carter. And then after another pass, it's this lovely little nest of a perfect gray fiber. And it goes just perfectly with that. Even this looks a little bit kind of streaky, kind of heathery almost, a heathery gray. But I'll show you. I'm really bad for not finishing all of my spinning before starting a knitting project, which isn't the best policy, but whatever. Embrace the chaos, it's just how I am. <laughs> so um, I just have these bits left to, left to card together. I just wanted to show them kind of in progress for, the, for this episode. But that finished nest of fiber has spun up into this somewhat uneven kind of neppy tweedy gray. It's not too bad, but there are still some clumps of white in there. And I'm using that as my contrast color with this blue. And I've actually already started the cinnamar shawl and I've only been working on this for like two days. It's honestly the fastest, one of the fastest projects ever. I feel like it's, I think it's the type of, I don't know, what do they call it? Like potato chip knitting. But I just love seeing how the colors work up and brioche I find to be really like I just one more row, one more row. Um, so I, I really like how it's working up so far. You can obviously see those kind of white bits in there. Like it's certainly not the most consistent, but I think a block will do it good. And I don't really mind too much. Like I knew that's what I was going to be getting out of it. And I, honestly, that's another lesson. So I, I just kind of grabbed that fiber. It wasn't the most expensive. It wasn't the cheapest, but it wasn't overly expensive at the show. Um, but I didn't necessarily inspect it for like the consistency of how well carded it was. And so now I know exactly how that shows up in the finished product. If there's kind of neps there in the in the fiber, in the prep fiber, um, they will carry through unless you make the effort to pull every single one of them out, which I wasn't going to do. So that is my current spin and knitting project. This is all I have spun at the moment, so I'm definitely going to need to keep working on that. And then last but not least is a bit of fleece that I've been working on, which again, learning experience. So I got some raw fleece from the Scottish Wool Producers Showcase as well. The guy didn't really know what the breed was. 
I think I've mentioned this before, but he basically said, like, you would have to go ask the sheep's grandparents what breed they were <laughs> um, and who they were dating when they were out in the field. Um, he just calls them black sheep. And on his website, that's what it is as well. I got this from Case Nest Yarns. So it's this dark brown fiber. It's kind of got bleach tips, I suppose, from being out in the sun. And it's not the longest staple. It's very, very springy. And I've just been, it's also got a bit of VM in it. Um, and I was just kind of like flicking the tips open with my carter. Again, I don't really know what I'm doing with this, but it was like five pounds for as much fiber as I wanted. So I just bought it to see what would happen. Um, <laughs> so I've been flicking the tips open and then putting it on the drum carter as well. And it's turning out okay. I don't know. I've done a, I've spun up one sample or like a couple samples so far and the resulting yarn is fairly soft and very, very springy. The main drawback I would say is that there is some VM in it because this yarn, these sheep weren't necessarily kept like for the purpose of hand spinning. So they, yeah, no one was trying to make sure that they were completely free of hay and all that. They've been out in the weather and the kind of fields of Scotland. So that is my current experiment. And again, I think it's going to be one of these things like, oh, now I see why you want to make sure that your fleece is as clean as possible when you buy it. But I'm not really minding it. Um, and it's all kind of a learning process. So yeah, that kind of all ties back into recommending that you try different tools and techniques. And again, don't be afraid to just try new things out. So I think that is my entire year of spinning. And as I'm looking at it all spread out on the ground in front of me, um, it's been quite a lot. Uh, yeah, I'm really pleased with how I've progressed over this year. And if I could have any final takeaways, I would say don't be afraid to just give it a go. You never know what might happen. You might find a new hobby that you love just as much as knitting or whatever you're currently into. And just to run over what my five lessons or recommendations were again, um, I would say one, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Be okay with being a beginner. It's the best way to learn. Um, number two, I would say start small, whether that's small quantities of fiber or small amounts of time. Starting small is one of the best ways to make sure that you don't get overwhelmed and you do want to continue working on this new hobby that you have picked up. My third one is to just use the good stuff. Use fiber or yarn. This applies to knitting as well, but use fiber that you actually want to work with. Don't just use whatever is cheap because you feel like you're a beginner and you'll ruin whatever you start out with. Um, my fourth lesson is to find an in-person group to meet with. And if you can't find in-person, find a good virtual group that um, will allow you to have a community. So I guess four is actually find a community of like-minded people. There's so much you can learn from talking about your craft with others and sharing um, about what you do and just picking up different techniques from other people. And lastly, I would say don't get stuck with one method or tool. Try different tools, try different methods. You might find a method that you like even more than whatever you first learned on. So definitely try different things out. I hope this has been an interesting look back at my first year of spinning. I have really enjoyed sharing it all with you. I would recommend anyone take up spinning, uh, even a drop spindle if you can't afford a wheel is certainly a good place to start and it's very re rewarding to feel that fiber turning into yarn. It's kind of like a, a, a form of magic. I can't really express how amazing it actually feels to turn fiber into yarn. It just feels like something that shouldn't be possible and yet all of a sudden you have something you can knit with. <laughs> if you liked this episode, I would really appreciate it if you gave it a like. Um, feel free to subscribe if you want to see more about what I'm doing in the future. And yeah, as always, I appreciate you watching. If you made it this far, thanks, and I'll see you again next time. Bye!